Welcome to the Meditation Ward. My name is Nadia, and I'm excited to bring you this podcast. Every week, I talk to interesting people who also meditate. Stick around for the episode after this for a guided meditation. Are you trying to create your own meditation practice? Well, you're in luck because in January, we're offering a live class starting the first Sunday in January for seven weeks. Each week, we're going to be offering new tools to help you create a practice that you love. This is a lifelong gift for yourself or for a friend, and I'm really excited to lead you in it. Go to themeditationward.com to sign up. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to your podcast because it helps more people find us, and we'd love to share this podcast with more people. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming back to the Meditation Ward. My name is Nadia, and today I'm very excited to talk to Reverend Mikey Noshul. He is a guiding teacher and co-director of Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville, Tennessee. That's where I met him. And in 2020, Mikey received lay ordination and empowerment to teach as a Dharma teacher in both Theravada and Maha... How do you say that? Mahayana. And Mahayana... Buddhist traditions. Mikey was given the name Rogarhi Sokatura. How do you say that? Is Rogahari that good? Sokatura. Yeah, Rogahari yeah, Sokatura, which means healer of the brokenhearted. He is committed to bringing the Buddhist teachings into non traditional settings such as addiction treatment centers and jails. He not only not only does he hold a master's degree in counseling psychology, he is also in a punk band, The Rip Tailors, with two singles releasing in 2024, and is currently working on his first book. Wow, you did it. <laughs> peace and love, peace and love. Thanks for having me, Nadia. Thanks for being here, Mikey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. this is great. So, yeah, I got to meet you um, at Wild Heart Meditation Center um, pretty recently, and that place has really been so... Um, helpful in my transition into Nashville and just getting deeper into my meditation practice. So thank you for what you do there. Yeah, we have a beautiful thing. It's definitely a unique and amazing thing we have at Wild Heart Meditation Center. So thanks for being a part of the Sangha, the community. Yeah, will you let people know kind of I mean, I'd never been to a meditation center mm -hmm. before I moved to Nashville and I do like yoga and meditation for years and I'd never even heard mm -hmm. of or been to something like that. Will you sure. let everybody know what um, Wild Heart is? Yeah, Wild Heart Meditation Center. We are a Buddhist meditation center in the uh, Theravada tradition, which would be the earliest forms of Buddhism. And we predominantly lean on the insight tradition. And it, in Wild Heart Meditation Center, it's like sometimes they say that uh, Vajrayana Buddhism is for like the artist or or Mahayana or Zen Buddhism is for the poet and Theravada is more for the psychologist. So we have a style at Wild Heart Meditation Center that fits really well with the mental health world. And so we get a lot of people in the addiction recovery world or a lot of people get like we get a referral from a therapist, come check out this meditation. And so we are very much rooted in the Buddhist tradition. And we have a very modern approach to our styles of meditation and our styles of Dharma, Dharma meaning the, the teachings of the Buddha. And the, the way we offer it is just like kind of like, sometimes we call it blue collar Dharma, really, it's just like, just anybody can come in straight from work and get a meditation and get some community in, get some Dharma in. And so we offer weekly classes and uh, generally our classes include a, uh, a guided meditation, roughly about 30 minute guided meditation, predominantly on things like mindfulness uh, or the heart practices, loving kindness meditation. And then we have a group of teachers that will offer like a 30 minute Dharma talk. And in our specific tradition, like what I'm talking about in recovery and mental health, we offer room for discussion. So it's not necessarily so much a top down lesson. It's like, let's approach this lesson together and have like, like a peer discussion around any of these Dharma topics, which I really appreciate. It's not such an authoritative environment. While we do have spaces for respecting 
some sense of tradition and authority it's like we soften that a little bit by having like these awesome like group discussions around dharma topics buddhist topics yeah so yeah it definitely does that answer it yeah it doesn't feel like i'm getting talked at there it does mm -hmm. feel like i it is like a part of us learning and sometimes yeah, we ask questions totally. and then the teachers are like well what do you think you know it's not like you're just being told what to do um yeah and that's the thing about buddhist practices right or i say practices uh, it's not so much of an intellectual thing it's something you do it's something you discover it's a very personal and intimate thing and so coming at uh, a class as a, a teacher i'm doing this as well and all i'm saying is hey i learned this method that shows us the ending of suffering and I'm taking this on myself and I've been doing it maybe a little bit longer than you. And now let me show you what I did and let's see how you do it. And I would love to hear how you do these practices and how they show up for you, right? So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not a belief system. It's not an intellectual philosophy. It's something you commit to and you have insight into, you discover for yourself. And uh, it's so rad, even just holding space as a teacher to witness people have these discoveries. Like somebody just walking right in, first time there, they got a lot of wisdom in their heart, right? Like things they say, it like lights me up. I was like, oh, I remember the first time I knew that that thought was just a thought and I don't have to obey my mind. And just seeing the relief they get when they go, wow, I don't have to believe everything I fucking think right oh excuse me i don't have it's to believe okay. everything i think you know it's like so good yeah yeah so i love it I, that that our style of doing things i love at wild heart yeah yeah uh, so did buddhism choose you or did you choose buddhism Ooh, buddhism <laughs> chose me and and it's 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 kind of you know like part of my claw, story like a little claw um 100 percent. and you were the chosen 100. teddy bear yeah totally totally and um yeah, yeah it's really definitely part of my story because i i come from a world like i grew up in the 80s where it was like the dare program or oh, yeah. the say no to drugs campaign and i just felt a lot of stigma around addiction and mental illness right especially around addiction and i grew up in an alcoholic family and it was not something to be talked about don't talk about suffering don't talk about what's going on in your life and then so with that pressure to hide my authenticity of what i'm living i found myself in the punk rock scene and punk rock saved my life you know many times it tried to kill me too but it, it definitely saved my life because i went from don't talk about it to let's get on stage and scream about it Right? And let's honor our suffering and let's make sure everybody knows I'm suffering. <laughs> and so, of course, that leaves a little room for improvement, though. And so it was there was a time in the early 2000s when there was this beautiful and strange intersection between punk rock and Buddhism. And so there was books coming out like dharma punks by noah levine uh hardcore zen by brad warner uh the, the indie spiritualist by chris grasso that took these two worlds that are seemingly different and brought them together to understand we're saying the same things like growing up don't talk about suffering punk rock's like okay let's, let's scream and yell about suffering buddhism's like no yeah there's suffering too like yeah we see you punk rock you're you're actually correct there is suffering in life and we can find an ending to our suffering so the first That's... lesson in buddhism is there's suffering in life and yeah. it's like thank you i've been i've been told that suffering is wrong it's bad it's, it's something i'm doing very personally and nobody else is and then buddhism's like yo we're all suffering here and i was like thank you thanks for telling me the truth now i can do what i need to do to get further away from that suffering and uh you know, to, to take this question even further, though, there was definitely very moving moments where it was like definitely the claw picking me up. Like, 
I was working at this bar restaurant in Destin, Florida, shout out to the 850. And I was uh, reading like all these books on like Buddhism, right? And But I was very active in my addiction, very, uh, very depressed, right? Not bathing a lot, living that punk rock life. And I was reading one book one night. It's uh, called At Hell's Gate. It's by a guy named Claude Anshin Thomas. Great book. It tells the story of a Vietnam veteran who eventually becomes a Buddhist monk. And so one night I'm reading this book and I was like, this is too good. I got to put it down because I got to go to work tomorrow. I put it down. I go to work and I'm working in this bar restaurant and I'm like the guy up front that's like hustling people, telling them to come in, showing them a good time because I had this like floppy blue mohawk with a dreadlock rat tail. I had the tattoos, <laughs> I had the look, right? And as I'm like, you know, barking at people, having, you know, showing them a good time and all that. Uh, the wildest thing, a group of German Buddhist nuns start coming up to this place, this, you know, bar restaurant in tourist spot, Destin, Florida. And it's like bald head, black ribs and everything. So I go up to them. I'm like, I've been reading about Buddhism. This is amazing. And in that group of German Buddhist nuns was Claude, Claude Anshin Thomas, the author of the book I was reading the very night before. And I like, you know, came at him quite aggressively, but he could hold that. I was like, yo, man, I was just reading your book. This is amazing. <laughs> like, it like freaked me out, right? Like, I was just reading this book about this guy. And the next day, He's in my life. That's a claw grab, right? Right. And he was so nice to me. He like gave me his number, called me up. I think I went to go meditate with him. I was no in way. Nest. That's wild. Yeah. And that dude saved my life, right? He Vietnam veteran, Zen. He was in the Zen tradition, Zen Buddhist monk. If you know anything about Zen, it could be very strict. You know anything about veterans, they can be very strict. I have peace and love to the veterans out there, but you know, like they're very strict. And I needed that in my life. And he helped me get sober. He helped me sort out my life and he showed me the Dharma. Been there while I cried, celebrated me. So uh that was my my claw picking me up in the the game of the Dharma, right? Yeah. 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 That's that's interesting how like how much punk rock and Buddhism at one point cross paths. Hopefully it still is because, yeah. yeah, yeah. What does it mean yeah. to be Buddhist? Like I think before, well, I'm still, you know, learning about it and figuring it mm -hmm. out and I'm learning what to take or what not to take or what works. And um, mm -hmm. uh, like when I was younger, I just knew you're supposed to get rid of everything you own, which yeah. it's like, oh, you have to get rid of everything. And then kind of learned a little bit more that it's like, you know, to relieve suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of like the two things that I kind of grew up thinking. And I think that might be common amongst mm -hmm. what people know of Buddhism. Um, yeah. Do you have something and like to little a little deaf definition that might yeah, sure sure what it would mean to be a buddhist huh yeah that was yeah and and there's so many things because on one end you know being a buddhist is almost like, tongue-in-cheek <laughs> you know it's calling yourself a buddhist because a lot of our practices in buddhism is to soften these self-identifications we have with the world right that we the the cause of our suffering is this illusion of i am i am my thoughts i am my belongings i am this identity and all of this and at the same time in a relative world we have to use these constructs of identity so while i do identify as a buddhist and i think it's kind of important for me to identify as a buddhist i hold it uh, quite lightly because i would still want to leave room for discovery i don't want to hold on to fixed views right but I do want to have a view that helps me along the way to end suffering, right? Yeah. And so the Buddha famously only taught suffering and its end. And so this is our mission in Buddhism. If you're looking for an end to suffering, that's the mission of Buddhism. And at the same time, I understand there's other paths that help you lessen suffering or maybe even eliminate suffering as the Buddha's Dharma does. 
So what would it mean to be a Buddhist? Like, okay, I want to take on this mission, right, of ending suffering. First thing is we take refuge. Refuge uh, in the Buddhist tradition is very important. A refuge is a place of safety. It's a place we can trust, a place we can go. And as the rains of the world of suffering uh, are naturally and inevitable are going to happen in life, where can we go to shelter ourselves from the rain of suffering? And this is what we call the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so taking refuge in the Buddha it almost sounds religious, right? <laughs> like I take refuge in this guy that died 2,600 years ago. And that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about refuge in the Buddha. We're not necessarily talking about a guy that we pray to. Yeah, because a what lot of people the, can become Buddhas. Well, no? Buddha, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. De definitely. Um, and so Buddha really means uh, the awakened one. So what Buddha is is an awakened thing you know sometimes we call it buddha nature that everything and everyone has buddha nature this awakened nature that we can tap into and so when we take refuge in the buddha we we take refuge in the possibility of the ending of suffering the possibility of the uh, awakening and we can do this you can end suffering you could do this and let's tap into that refuge of not even eventually end suffering right here and now if you follow these practices and pain arises, okay, we can awaken to that pain with compassion. And in that moment, there is no suffering. As pain arises and we meet it with hatred and aversion and we push it out, we are suffering. So let's take refuge in the Buddha as pain arises and be at ease with our pain, be compassionate and caring with our pain. That's the refuge of the Buddha. And then we take refuge in the Dharma, and the Dharma is the teachings of the Buddha. We take refuge in all in the Theravada tradition, our lists, right? The Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, right? And so this takes some education. It takes some knowing intellectually to have a map to follow that we can shelter ourselves with. And, uh, you know, it's almost like, for me, an emotional thing that it's been 2,600 years. People have gone from chanting these things to writing them down to passing it down. My teachers have passed this down to me. So when I take refuge in the Dharma, not only the, the lessons, but the people that have passed it down, people like, like I said, Claude Anshin, Venerable Paniwadi, down to like Ajahn Chah, Mahasi Saidao, Deepa Ma, like these people that I love, some of them I haven't even met, but they're in my tradition to pass down these lessons to me. And then I take refuge in them. And then the third refuge is the Sangha. The, the Sangha would mean the community, right? That I can take refuge in Wild Heart Meditation Center that when I don't want to go to show up to the meditation, I remember to take refuge. I go, yeah, this will actually help me. <laughs> uh, you know, so that's kind of what it means to be a Buddhist. It's like, oh, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha to keep my heart in the right place, keep me in this training to end suffering. Yeah. yeah, I found as a teacher, like there's one thing is like, you know, like through yoga, there's one thing to be a student and then there's this whole other step of like giving, but also learning on a deeper level when you're offering. Yeah. Um, because it makes you go deeper because people need you <laughs> and it mm -hmm. makes you show up differently. Um, because it's a big role. Yeah, this is this is a way of life, right? It, it's not a profession. I never thought in a million years, this is not something that I could apply for being a Dharma teacher. Right? Yeah, you're screaming on stage and you're like, hmm, maybe I should be a Dharma teacher. I check out Indeed, <laughs> like maybe I could do this. Uh, oh, it's a way of life, right? And uh, everything is our meditation. Uh, we can, you know, sit on the cushion and wish loving kindness towards all beings. And then we get from off the cushion. Now what? Okay, well, let's bring our practice in our partnerships, in our uh, relationships, in our uh, work, in our, uh, our, our consumption of food, in our, even our sexual behaviors, 
anything is our practice if we let it be so giving a talk yeah now that now i'm dharma talk meditation right <laughs> saying hi to people now i'm saying friendly meditation uh you know driving home from the class now i'm driving meditation <laughs> so one of my teachers says that meditation and daily life are not separate so everything's our meditation and yeah so holding space for people is a wonderful meditation yeah, yeah. love it <laughs> um so of course you know physical relationships and sex like rings a bell <laughs> like sure. he's he said that so like how mm -hmm. is how can you make that a part of meditation or ending suffering like how does mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. do you like or you even said food it doesn't have to be just based on that yeah uh, but yeah yeah our, our senses right that all of these senses uh, that they can be quite seductive right the eyes the ears the nose the tongue the body and the thinking mind too is considered a sense in buddhism and the buddha gave a sermon called the fire sermon that the the eyes are on fire with craving right the ears are on fire with craving that we live in these craving bodies right uh, and we have to live with them so how do we figure out how to properly live with this body that's naturally on fire with craving right and so with you know sex particularly that can be a very uh, craving uh, situation um and when we approach things like sexuality with you know some cravings lust and all of that's wonderful in sex but when we take it too far and we look at other people or, or you know or even like things like pornography and stuff like that we we lose the humanity of whoever's involved in our sexuality that, that can create a lot of issues so when we use our practice in our sexual behavior it, we want to bear witness to the people we are involved in and understand and bring a heart of compassion that all people um, experience pain and so let's witness this and open our hearts up to the other people we're involved with sexually and understand them as a human and also using why speech you know one of the eightfold paths is why speech and so using communication in an intimate way of understanding the person or people you're involved with sexually can be very helpful in our dharma practice right and um you know it, it's just uh, sometimes we can consume people and it can create a lot of harm so i think when you bring an in intimacy with your sexuality it's uh, a little bit more um uh, helpful yeah, yeah. um I, we're in a similar uh age group i'm 41. i know we mm -hmm. you talked about dare and all that stuff so i grew up like mm -hmm. probably around the same time and yeah. um i was wondering because you know we didn't have tinder and things like that until we were older we had like other sure. dating sites a little bit but the way that things have become such a throwaway culture um, mm. especially when i was living in la for 11 years it's so hard to date there because there's mm. so many beautiful people and you mm. do one thing that might be of an interest to a person and you're just a swipe away from somebody else that might mm. fill these um, desires for them until mm. they don't. And then there's somebody else that they'll try, you know? And mm. I'm wondering if like working with, um, probably because you work with addiction, you might work with some younger people. Sure. Do you notice that that is a harder concept because communication can be really hard, especially when mm. you're in a space of like, not really needing to be attached to someone because there's someone else always there yeah you, you know i i can't I, I'm, i've been married a long time and i'm kind of uh well i'm extremely grateful dating's hard right yeah. <laughs> dating's very hard and i have a lot of empathy because i remember how hard it was back in the day my wife actually asked me out on MySpace. I was talking about this yesterday <laughs> uh, with a friend to, to be like, I, I oh, what time I have business cards period? still that had my MySpace on them. Yeah, yeah. MySpace was the best, right? yeah. you know. <laughs> but, you could design um, your own backgrounds. It was like so much more personalized. And, I had and a CNC so, Music Factory <laughs> quote at the top of mine. A CNC Music Factory, hell to, yeah. 
<laughs> I saw them once. I saw the Music Factory that's once. Hell awesome. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, that's awesome. Uh, so, but, but yeah, uh, what I think I, the point is, if I'm going to look at this from a, a Buddhist perspective, is it's going to be hard no matter what, right? That we are always in difficult times. How are we holding these difficulties? And we have difficulties of, you know, not being able to find people or, you know, or we have the difficulties of being just swiped. It's a, it's a difficult time at all times it, it, to a certain degree in Buddhism. So it's like, can we just open up to that difficulty that dating's hard, isn't it? Whether it's on some app or whether it's in a bar, it's like, yeah, like, and it sounds like you got a few feelings around this, huh? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm asking you directly, right? If that's okay with you, do oh. you have a few feelings around that? Yeah, I'm luckily in a healthy relationship now for like three and yeah. a half years, but that's one of the first times in like 20 years that I really have like been loved for me yeah, yeah. there you so, go yeah in LA though it was um and even when I first moved to Richmond before I found him it's it is very hard yeah and I felt yeah. like I would always choose people that I liked them more than they liked me and I was always mm. like trying to fight for their attention and that was like my pattern of like yeah. trying to get someone to care about me which never mm -hmm. works and is very painful mm -hmm. yeah yeah and there's there's the end of suffering. So what I'm talking about here is the four noble truths. The first noble truth is inevitable life. There is going to be painful experiences. All right. The the Buddha said, birth, aging, sickness, death, sorrow, lamentation, grief, and despair. Uh, not getting what you want and getting things you don't want. I think we can throw dating in there too. <laughs> right. First noble truth. There's what we call dukkha. Duca, that sounds that very, very true to dating. <laughs> Not getting right. what you but, want and getting what you don't want. <laughs> it's pretty common. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it, it's universal. We all experience this. But the second noble truth is the cause of suffering is our reactive and repetitive craving. You know, addiction, the craving, uh, the craving to become, you know, the, that wanting craving, gimme, gimme, gimme. And then also the craving of of not wanting, the craving of non-existence. And so in relationships, we discover these things like some of us cling. Some of us cling to love. Give me more. Don't leave me. I need you. I need you. And other of us are leave me alone. Give me my space. I need my isolation. Get, get rid of that person. And so this is what the beauty of the third noble truth leads us to, the awakening. And what we awaken to is the ways we crave, the ways we're causing ourselves suffering. And the way you were causing yourself suffering was the chase, right? The, the, the craving, the uh, overly attaching to another person, right? And so when you see it, now you can end that suffering, right? So it's like, oh yeah, I've noticed I'm, I'm, I'm craving this relationship. And as soon as you notice it, Ooh, that opens up some doorways to the beautiful third noble truth is uh, Nibbana, awakening, the, the freedom from suffering. And then if anybody's following along on my list, we have the fourth noble truth is the, the, the path, the how to do it. So, yeah. 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 Um, something that I noticed about you when I first met you and continuously notice about you is mm -hmm. the, that you have. I mean, for those of you who are not watching this on YouTube, like Mikey has tattoos up his neck and down his hands, and he, yet he also has this softness about him mm. and um, a sparkle in his eyes mm. that is just mm. like welcoming, <laughs> but also like just open for you. It's not asking for anything. He just has a glow and a softness. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, like a hardcore teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for saying that. Yeah, so sweet. and um, how, I mean, so how long have you been clean? How long did it feel like it's taken you to get to this path? And then I have a third question that you probably don't have an answer to, but like on like a scale of like one to a hundred, how close to the end of suffering are you? <laughs> or are you already there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> are you awake? Sure, sure. So first question, how, how long have I been 
Well, so like this path and uh, my addiction recovery, right? Uh, I'm an alcoholic, somebody living with depression. I'm also an adult child of an alcoholic, right? So uh, the, the manifestations of my suffering is quite broad. Um, so I found the, the Dharma or like I said, the, the Dharma found me, the Buddhist teachings found me. And it wasn't like, oh, next day I cleaned up, right? <laughs> uh, so it took some time, definitely, uh, ups and downs, and clean times and relapses. And um, But I've been consecutively sober. I, 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 alcohol is my main drug of choice. I've been consecutively sober for 12 years. And uh, while I have respect and all sorts of love and, and I'm kind of in the bubble of the 12-step program, it's really this dharma is my main program and even other paths within the dharma things like refuge recovery was a great support for me we have recovery dharma at wild heart which is a great program that uses buddhist practices and principles for uh, the approach of addictions of all kinds so that's my main program um but i was doing it before those programs existed and i'm like i felt alone like oh i'm the only one doing this buddhist recovery thing and then uh, these programs started coming out and I was like, oh, thanks. They're like, this is great that other people are now applying these things. And so, yeah, it's know, a decade and a half of doing Buddhist stuff. I, I got into Buddhism when I was like mid, mid 20s and I, I felt very young and I was very young to be doing it. And now it's so rad to see like Wild Heart. It's like, oh, I see these people even younger than I was when I started. And that's cool. So those, I think those first two questions about getting into this and getting into recovery are kind of yeah. intertwined with me. Um, um, real quick before we get to how enlightened are you, um, I sure. had a conversation um, with Lily, who's um, last week's episode, because um, she's much younger than me. She's like Gen X or something, like Z. She's like Gen Z. <laughs> yeah. And as, yeah. like, as a yoga teacher, I meet a lot of younger people that are wanting to teach. And I'm always like, whoa, you guys are so far ahead of your time. I wish I had that offered to me. I was asking Lily if she notices the difference, um, if you even can when you when that's your space. But she kind of mentioned that there's a whole like wave of this happening right now in the world that we're all mm -hmm. coming a little bit more open to the spiritual work. And that just happens to be now, which just happens to be this time in her life. You know, when for us, yeah. it's a little bit I didn't find this stuff until like my late thirties, you know, yeah. I was like jealous, but it's like, oh, mm -hmm. this is the wave of which it came. You're lucky that it was that age for you. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be me if it wasn't, if I was that at your age, <laughs> I would mm -hmm. be totally mm -hmm. different. So um, that's like why I think a lot of younger people are coming in now with so much insight and curiosity. Yeah, I was having uh, lunch with Andrew Chapman, the, 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 my like teaching partner he was the previous guiding teacher at wild heart and we we're just like hanging out eating you know vegan sushi at this place and like our surfer was like young you know whatever gen z whatever and we were just like we have so much confidence in the younger generation they yeah. seem so great <laughs> like they're awesome so yeah shout out to the younger folks y'all are doing it right <laughs> they are yeah yeah Okay, yeah. so um, back to um, your level. Where do you feel like you are? Mm -hmm. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ass in the chair, breath in front of me. Here it is. Yeah, in the in the Zen tradition, Mahayana tradition. Such a tradition. beautiful Buddhist answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like oh, <laughs> right here. Let down. But, <laughs> It's right here. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, no goals to accomplish, no one you even need to be. It's all right here. You know, that's what it's saying in the, the Heart Sutra. Uh, we chant the Heart Sutra quite often in the Zen tradition. We, and it says, far beyond all delusion, nirvana is already here. So nirvana meaning awakening. It's right here. It's right here. So the more we can take refuge in this um, awakening or so-called enlightenment, it's right here, you know? The more we try to get enlightened, the less enlightened we actually are. 
But the more we discover that it's it's all right here, it's all right here, over and over again. You know, normally we think something about gaining enlightenment is from going from here to there. But in this practice, we're trying to go from there to here, there to here, over and over again. And so, you know, sometimes the awakening we receive isn't the awakening we want. And then it was like, oh, I must not be awakened because this is extremely painful. Or my mind is like so anxious right now. Or my leg really hurts right now. Or I have, you know, IBS, whatever it may be, right? That's actually your awakening. Your awakening is in the middle of your IBS. Land in it and awaken <laughs> to your irritable, irritable bowels, right? And that's what the Buddha taught, right? And of course, there are systems and maps for people that need a little bit more striving. But let's be real. It's all right here over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, uh, something that I try to work with is just understanding that I'm in a human body and this mm. is part of the human experience. Um, mm. Which I guess I don't have IBS, but I have other... <laughs> Duca, Duca. Some, we got Duca. some indigestion <laughs> i have i have bipolar too um i cry during the taylor swift and um <laughs> jelly roll documentaries like um <laughs> so sometimes when i'm very feeling a lot of emotions um i said you're you're in a human body and this mm -hmm. is part of the human experience and you showed mm -hmm. up into this body because you wanted your soul on some level wanted to experience what it is to be human. Hmm. Um, so that kind of helps me. So I guess in that case, it would kind of be like, well, you're in a human body who has the privilege of experiencing IBS. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So how would, yeah. um, as like, as in Buddhism, how would you approach that awakening moment in the, in IBS? Let's just stick with IBS. <laughs> So, yeah, when we're talking about the first noble truth, Dukkha, that there's always going to be some challenge, <laughs> some pain in life, whether it's dating, whether it's IBS, whether it's, you know, mental illness, there's always going to be something. And so where the suffering is, is our hatred or our greed or our delusion. This is what the Buddha called the three poisons. And so if we hate the IBS, Oh, we're <laughs> suffering. But if we just okay, would be present with the IBS and like just witnessing it, just noticing it, like feeling it, like where in the body is this IBS and where is my mind with it? And as the mind starts going, mm -mm, this is wrong, this is bad, I hate this, this sucks. Notice that mind, that's where the suffering is and see if you can come back to the IBS and see its movements, its edges. And then the mind goes, no, I need to get away from this. I need, I need a beer or I need potato chips or I need oh, to watch TV. I need to escape this. And you know, oh yeah, that's the greed in the mind, the craving for something more pleasurable. Than that. That's the cause of suffering. And then we come back to the feeling of IBS. And then we go into like, okay, I, you know, I need to fix this. I need to control my IBS. Like, what if I did this or that and that and this? And you go, oh, that's delusion in the mind. Oh, there's delusion. I'm like overly self-identifying with this IBS. Okay, let me come back to the IBS. And that's our practice, right? Watch the cause of suffering isn't the IBS. It's our mind's addiction to pleasure or aversion to pain or overly self-identifying with this body like you're saying like as mental illness arises like are we self-identifying with our diagnosis right <laughs> are we self-identifying with our physical diagnosis and so it's uh it's quite freeing to know that there's another option out there because like this one's saying like with punk rock it was like I just want somebody to acknowledge that there's like pain in this life and Buddhism did that. And that that's like an immediate relief that is like, it's totally okay to hurt. It's okay. And, and that's where our practice unfolds is what's our relationship to this pain. And 
maybe we just need to tolerate it. Maybe we can bring love towards it, compassion towards it, you know, care, you know, and that's when we train. That's the training. Easier said than done. And I understand. Yeah. And so the more we train ourselves to do these things, that's our karma, the habit. You know, our mind is a mental pattern. What one frequently thinks and ponders upon will become the inclination of the mind. That's what the Buddha taught. So thoughts are habitual karma. And so if we have a habit, myself definitely included, to hate pain, uh, we're, we're going to continue that pattern of suffering. So if we can shift that attitude towards kindness, acceptance, and compassion, over time, that's the training we commit to right now, over and over again, by training my mind. And that will be our, you know, modern neuroscience calls it neural pathway, you know? So that will be our, our, our hardwiring of awakening over and over again. Well, it is right now, yes, but we can get skilled at coming back to right now, yeah. yeah. Um, and then going to a doctor mm -hmm. yeah. for your IBS. Yeah. Is like, like there's one thing about being okay with it and like, mm -hmm. but then also we can go to yeah, doctors. That's, so sure. <laughs> that's not go like... to a doctor with compassion in your mind. Right. Okay. So there's not like, with like a drive to have to fix everything because you're so uncomfortable. Like, sure. And you know, if that's what happens, that's okay too. Like, like this isn't black and white, right? Even if the mind's like, I, I hate this, right? Like, even if that hates in your mind, the best way I found to be with hate in your mind is with compassion. <laughs> so we're not even our minds. So even if the mind does hate this, you're not going to be able to do this overnight and just be like, yeah, the mind is like totally hating things right now. Yeah. Can I even be compassionate towards the mind that hates this right now, right? And so as we're driving to the doctor, like, I hate this. Like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And at the same time, the the when to go to the doctor you know that we are not in a space of repression in buddhism what we call non-reactivity reactivity is the cause of suffering so pain arises we immediately go to i gotta escape this i got i gotta get rid of this i gotta hate this that immediate response that's reactivity we wanted less than reactivity but we also have a wholesome response right and so as something like IBS arises, like noticing where the reactivity is, but also noticing when to pause and go, yeah, I need to go to the doctor because <laughs> that's the most compassionate thing right now. Yeah. And so it's not ignorant. That's what we, you know, ignoring our pain. We need to respond to our pain and not only the pain in our body, but the pain in the world, right? We don't really re respond to the pain in the world with violence and and uh, fixed views and intolerance, but we need to engage in the world to have a healthy world. Uh, my kitchen, right? I don't need to go, ah, there's dirty dishes in my kitchen. That's just dukkha. <laughs> Peace and love, you dirty dishes. No, I gotta do to my dishes. I gotta respond to the situation I find myself in. Time to clean some dishes, right? And that's the most compassionate thing for me right now is to have a clean kitchen, right? And so, it's this play of, it, yes, it's inevitable that there's pain in life. And how do I live in this painful world and with a compassionate heart? And leaning back into Zen practices, we have something we call the Bodhisattva vow. And the first Bodhisattva vow is uh, beings are numberless. I vow to free them all. So beings are numberless. We Infinite amount of beings in the world. I vow to free them all. Impossible. It's an impossible task. It's an impossible task to keep this body healthy, but I'm going to take that task on. It's an impossible task to help everyone in the world, but I'm going to take that task on. It's an impossible task to keep my kitchen clean, but I'll take that, that task on. We need to understand it is impossible to free this world from the pain, but the best way we can end suffering is, you know, let's give it a shot, right? <laughs> yeah, in a non-reactive way. So yeah. have that balance, right? One of the tricky things that um, I I find is the opposite side of that, which is like joy 
and knowing that we're also clinging to these things that make us happy. It's not mm -hmm. just about like clinging or hating the things that we hate. And because just like the things that we hate or are uncomfortable will come and go and the yeah. things that make us happy are also going to come and go. So this is gotten into my head a little bit too much to the point where I was like at a wedding this weekend and I was like, so this is a joyful moment and this moment will pass. But like this moment should be joyful, mm -hmm. but is that okay <laughs> that we're like, want these beautiful, joyful moments or I don't know if that makes sense, but it, mm -hmm. it starts to become this like annoying question in my head almost a lot yeah yeah good good question right like things are fun like yeah the body has fun <laughs> the heart loves things that's great isn't that awesome yeah yeah and so this is sometimes what we call non-attached appreciation or non-attached gratitude like we have both sides of these uh uh, dichotomies in life, pleasure and pain. And so how do we meet both of these things? And you may notice I'm more of a aversion type that I, I hate things a lot, <laughs> but we may have this other dichotomy on this side with the, the greed, the, the grasping, the craving. How do I be in this fun, joyful world without creating suffering, right? Yeah, there's pain in life, that's inevitable, but there's also pleasure in life, that's inevitable. How do I live well? in this and i think to a certain degree without obsessing about it these questions that you're asking yourself is a, a very wholesome practice like yeah like i'm having such a fun time and this will end yeah and like i bring for this the practice. bride and groom i was thinking about when i'm in that place like not oh. just for me enjoying the wedding but like for yeah. the bride and groom it's like such a beautiful yeah. moment that it's like should be so celebrated and like this uh -huh. pure moment of happiness yeah, yeah. yet things that are so happy or things that we love in my head falls into some place where we're not supposed to be attached to them mm -hmm. but joy should be in these beautiful moments mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah well in that word attachment too and supposed to right where this word attachment is kind of a difficult balance, especially when we're talking about like wild heart, where we have like definitely a, like a psychology side of things and a Buddhist side of things. And so the word attachment, things like attachment theory, John Bowlby and Mary Amesworth, where they speak of attachment in a very healthy way, right? That humans are built to attach, right? And I think that word attachment, they should have used the word bond. Like humans are meant to bond with one another. And so when you see somebody like, and they're going through this beautiful rite of passage into the next part of their life and you feel all these emotions with them, that's what it's like to be a human. Emotions are contagious. When somebody's experienced joy and we experience joy for them, that's what the Buddha called mudita, sympathetic joy. Yeah, right? I only met them once before and I'm crying. I'm crying at the wedding. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that's what humans are meant to do, bond, right? But when we try to control it, right? Control, we know better for them, right? You should be doing this and you should be doing that. Or, and we're not open to just cry and to let that feeling arise, let it pass and enjoy it while it's here. Like that's not attachment. It's just what it's like to be a human. And it's like, yeah, I'm like stoked for them and, like, I'm stoked for me too. Like, yeah, a wedding sounds great. This is awesome. And that that thought arises, that feeling arises. And none of these things are personal. It's actually what it's like to be a human. Humans go through these awesome ceremonies and rites of passage through our entire existence of humanity. It's something quite primal of us to root for one another and cheer each other on and, and bear witness to one another as we go through these, uh, you know, rites of passage, that's like, like, like calling them. Because rites of passage, like, tells our systems, yeah, it's time to move forward. Like, this concept of rebirth that we talk about in Buddhism, not necessarily after we die, but in every moment we're reborn and we're witnessing a rebirth into a new relationship.
this is amazing. And I don't know if that's attachment, right? Like in the Buddhist sense, it's like, I'm feeling with them. That's like a bonding thing. And humans are meant to bond with one another, right? And I guess Wu -Tang Clan. Wu-Tang Clan, go ahead. Word is bond, you know, word is bond. <laughs> but yeah, what do you say? Um, I don't, I don't know. Oh, I said community. Yeah, Sangha, Sangha. Yeah. That's what we call it in our refuges, Sangha. Yeah. Yeah. One of the first mm. things that, we've got to wrap it up, but <laughs> one of the first things that happens, like, probably to me and as well as thousands of other people that are working on having less suffering in their life. And then mm -hmm. I have these thoughts. I'm like, it's a negative thought about something that happened. And then my first response then it's like, oh, you're not supposed to have thoughts like that. That's <laughs> wrong. And then it's like, no, you need to have compassion for this side of you that's having thoughts like that. And send mm -hmm. love to that part of you. And where's mm -hmm. that part of you coming from? And it's like, it's, I think it's probably a lot when you start um mm -hmm. to try to figure out how to rewire that sure yeah yeah and that's it remember love right that in the dhammapada is the fifth verse uh the buddha said hatred is not appeased by hatred hatred is appeased by love and so as hate arises in our mind understand it's just longing for love there's only two things in our experience let's make it simple there's only two things there's only what's loved and there's only what's longing to be loved. And so even the hate in our mind as that arises, oh, I love you too, hatred, because we are never going to be able to get rid of hatred with more hatred. It's even like neuroscience verifies this, the neural pathways. If you have a pathway of hatred arising and it's ingrained in that pathway, if you try to hate that more, you're just ingraining a more stronger pathway of hatred. And so as hatred arises in your mind, and it's a habit of a neural pathway, if you say, oh, I love you, hatred, that's a whole different pathway. You're creating new habits in your mind. And it's like, it intellectually makes sense. But when we're in it, it's like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure I hate this hatred. I'm pretty sure this hatred is not worthy of my love. I'm pretty sure that the annoyance in my mind or the craving in my mind, my addiction, eh. That's that's actually morally bad. I, you know, I, I don't think that's allowed. <laughs> you know, and it's like, ah, oh, everything. Like, let the heart open. Everything's allowed. And as somebody punk rocker feels outcasted by society sometimes. And you know, it's like, I don't want to create a society within me that outcasts things that aren't pretty, right? Aren't that's lovely, good, that look like they don't fit in. That's a good way of looking at it, yeah. <laughs> If, yeah yeah that's a really nice way of looking at it there's a quote i want to look up really quick because i've heard you say that um mm -hmm. hate um mm -hmm. it's a martin luther king mm -hmm. um darkness cannot drive out darkness only light can do that hate cannot drive out hate only love can do that it's martin mm -hmm. luther king jr and i love yeah. that quote um yeah. yeah yeah he got it he got it right yeah, it's a universal truth. And, the, you know, when we talk about the Dharma, like the Buddha owned it. It sounds like MLK touched into that Dharma too. The, yeah. the Dharma, this universal truth. Yeah, of, our great, like, all, this is most of the great teachers, yeah, they have a similar message. Mm -hmm. Message is. Yeah. Even like, I think like the prayer of St. Francis has something similar to that, right? Or it, it, you know, it's like how often we can just sit and, and ponder upon what love really is, right? What a confusing thing, that word love. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure love is grasping and clinging on to a person. It's like, oh, no, I don't think that's love. You know, <laughs> like, you know, what is love? I think, uh, no, love is the opposite of hate. I don't know, maybe, is it? <laughs> so just sitting around trying to figure out what that love is, is it's so good. Yeah. Um. So as usual in my podcast about meditation, I forget to mm -hmm. ask about people's meditation practices until the mm -hmm. end because I so enjoy sure. the conversations. So um, just touching on what your meditation practice looks like now mm -hmm. and advice that you might have to people coming back to meditation or starting their meditation practice. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then the last thing is uh, maybe telling us what kind of meditation you plan on leading us in. Yeah. And so a good amount of my meditation these days is rooted in loving kindness. And loving kindness is uh, it comes from this Pali Sanskrit word, metta, M-E-T-T-A. And this is a quality of, of what we're talking about, indiscriminate friendliness, you know, expanding the heart in all directions up to the skies, downward to the depths, outward unbounded, in all directions, wishing all beings ease. And so taking time to really cultivate a heart of loving kindness, of metta, that's like my main practice. And that is a doorway into insight, uh, doing insight practices of looking at the uh, impermanence in life, the unsatisfying in life, and the impersonal in life. Right. So I use loving kindness as a doorway into deeper insight personally. And so somebody getting into this practice, like, you know, how do we do that? And typically we talk about these two wings in our practice. We have the wisdom wing and we have the, the, the compassion wing. We have seeing clearly on this wisdom wing and responding wisely on the compassion wing. And as we do these two wings, uh, generally, we, we do something with mindfulness on the wisdom wing. So mindfulness gives us a way to focus our attention on something like the breath and then watch the mind leave the breath and go into the stories, judgments, plans, fantasy. And then we come back to the breath. And we do this enough, something happens. We start uh, untangling ourselves from our thoughts. Doesn't mean we get rid of our thoughts but we start seeing our thoughts. We use the mind to view the mind. In psychology, they call this metacognition. We are able to witness our thoughts. And when we witness our thoughts, that opens up so much opportunity. Oh, the mind is irritated right now. Oh, the mind is grasping right now. And it gets us that impersonal nature of the mind. Knowing a thought is a thought. As I like to say, meningergy, Burmese teacher says, a thought of your mother is not your mother, it's a thought. And so when we practice mindfulness enough, we just notice these thoughts. What a relief. It's just a thought. I don't have to believe every thought I think. And then we bring in this other wing of what we call the compassion wing, the heart practices. And so as we notice these thoughts arise, we can now use our own karma to cultivate a mind that's helpful through practices like loving kindness. And the way we do this is by saying phrases silently towards ourselves to incline the neural pathway of may I be at ease, may I be at peace, may I be kind and gentle with myself, may I be filled with loving kind, right? And so hopefully that makes sense. You start by kind of just, just dryly wit witnessing your thoughts. Okay, yeah, that's there. Oh, I'm lost in thought, come back to the breath. Oh, I'm lost in thought, come back to the breath. And that's a solid practice of mindfulness. And then in, in other meditation sessions you will do things like loving kindness as you see the thought now you can incline it in a direction that leads you away from suffering from not outcasting your inside of yourself by yourself like you said like sending not <laughs> that sounded like a koan okay what, what was it not can you say that again well you kind of said it. it's like you were already being an out felt like you're an outcast from the outside so mm -hmm. If you're going to outcast your feelings on the inside by yourself, that's really painful. So using yep. loving kindness mm -hmm. to not outcast yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I need to see myself with mindfulness, myself, you know, like, but, but in this uh, constructed relative way, I need to see myself, right? Okay. My so-called self has a lot of wild thoughts in here <laughs> whoa <laughs> right and then loving kindness is like, hey i love you all <laughs> that would be a peace and ease with all of you you know <laughs> but yeah. may i be at peace with this mind that's wild with this heart that's broken with this gut that hurts with this body that's in so much pain right may i be at peace with all of you you know and that's the the balance of this practice witness it and then love it <laughs> yeah yeah okay. Thank you for that. Um, uh, what kind of meditation are you going to lead us in? Is it going to be oh. similar to that? 
Yeah, let's just do some loving kindness meditation. And what we want to do is just make this very simple, right? Like, like I said, like having something to come back to is is key. And what I want to guide you all in is a loving kindness practice, metta. And the thing we come back to are these phrases. May I be at ease. May I be at peace. May I be kind and gentle with myself. May I be filled with loving kindness. And we'll just silently repeat that to ourselves. In so many ways, this is quite beneficial, right? As the mind wanders away from these phrases, notice it's wandered and then come back to the phrase. And so there is even a little bit of mindfulness in the practice of loving kindness. Yeah. And then as we're saying this to ourselves, it's like just ingraining that habit. It's like getting a song stuck in your head. And so it's creating that neural pathway of loving kindness. And then as these old neural pathways arise of craving, grasping, greed, hatred, all of those characters in the mind, may I be at ease with the craving in the mind. May I be at peace with the conflict in my heart. Okay. May I be kind and gentle with myself as I do. May I be filled with loving kindness. All of it, all up with loving kindness. Yeah. Right. And so that's the the practice. And these are just examples of the fruit of this practice of all the different ways it can show up in you. Um, so, uh, yeah. 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 Um, do you have any uh, social links that you want to tell people about? They'll also be in the bio below. Mm -hmm. We can link some of your music to there when it comes out, your singles, and <laughs> your book when it's ready, but where people can find Wild Heart or you personally that you'd like to share with people. Yeah, um, wildheartmeditationcenter.org. You can find us there. That's our website, main website. Um, and then our socials, uh, Instagram, at Wild Heart Nashville. Uh, you got Facebook, just look us up, Wild Heart Meditation Center. You got TikTok, Wild Heart Meditation. Uh, we got YouTube, a lot of the meditations and Dharma talks on YouTube. If you look us up anywhere, you get this podcast, Wild Heart Meditation Center. You can find Dharma Talks, Guided Meditations. Um, so yeah, check us out, Wild Heart Meditation Center. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you giving your time and just like having this really interesting and fun conversation and just seeing where it goes, where it went. Yeah. Th thank you for uh, having this conversation with me this is great and then you know sometimes i have to take a step back and be like oh we're like recording something right now because <laughs> it's a wonderful conversation and i want to acknowledge that we are recording something right now and thank you for doing this that this is a wonderful effort that you are doing with your time and it's such a, a an honorable thing because i know how much meditation has helped me and really saved my life and it's with all my heart that I express gratitude to you for doing this and whoever is listening to this. Like, don't squander this meditation practice. Don't squander that you're hearing this right now. And deep gratitude, deep bows for you for doing this podcast. And thank you so much for doing it. Thank you. Thank you for saying that because it truly is a labor of love because it's very mm -hmm. rare to make money on a podcast yeah. <laughs> these days. Yeah. There's so many of them. So I just feel fortunate to get to keep learning from people and have these conversations and get to share them. And uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, the balance though. Yeah, we got to make some money here and there yeah. and understand the fruits of your karma is going to be better than any finance you can receive. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, thank yeah. you. And um, I hope everyone joins us for the meditation in the next episode. Thank you so much, Mikey. Thanks. Peace and love. Thank you guys for listening. We hope you stick around for the meditation on the next episode. If you're interested in wellness coaching through a meditative lens or starting your own meditation practice with accountability, check out TheMeditationWar.com. Give us a follow on Instagram at The Meditation Ward, and please like, review us, and share with your friends. See you soon.